Welcome to the week five video lecture for Fish and Wildlife Policy Programs and Issues. This week, we will explore the development of policy and management programs for single species and ecosystems. Historically, fish and wildlife management focused on maintaining game populations or fish stocks. In the mid-1900s, many state fish and game management agencies were focused solely on the management of a small number of species such as white-tailed deer, turkey, quail, and other important game species whose populations had plummeted due to overhunting. The development of individual species management programs began to improve populations as hunting regulations were developed and enforced. In some states, reintroduction programs were initiated. In Missouri, plummeting populations of wild turkeys prompted the Conservation Department to close the hunting season in 1938. In the early 1950s, they trapped and released birds throughout the state in one of the country's most successful conservation efforts. By 1971, their success allowed them to trade abundant turkeys with ruffed grouse from Minnesota as each state focused on species that needed intensive management efforts. In Arkansas, black bears were almost completely extirpated from the state by 1940. State game and fish biologists brought in 40 bears from Minnesota and Canada in what will become the most successful bear restoration pro project in the world, reestablishing a huntable population that now exceeds 3,000. Among game species management tools, the manipulation of hunting seasons is the most common. The duration and timing of a season can have big impacts on wildlife populations. Limiting harvest to males only is one way to ensure good reproduction the following year. Bag limits can be adjusted based on population goals. For some big game species, studies show that periodic harvesting every two or more years can result in higher productivity since it allows animals to reach a higher age. Permits can be limited to ensure that a maximum number of animals are harvested. Food resources have long been a focus of wildlife management. The planting of food plots on public and private lands remains a common practice, in spite of the fact that seasonal food availability is not often a key limiting factor. Habitat enhancement practices are far more effective in boosting populations and individual health. The Endangered Species Act brought a new focus on the management of plant and animal species that were in danger of extinction. The U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and the National Marine Fisheries Service began developing species recovery plans and in intensive efforts aimed at reversing declines and reducing threats for listed species. The goal of this process is to restore the species to the point where it is a secure, self-sustaining part of its eco ecosystem and to the point that protections under the Endangered Species Act are no longer needed. This involves protecting and often restoring the habitat in which the species can thrive. Recovery plans serve as roadmaps for species recovery. They lay out where we need to go and how best to get there. Recovery plans are guidance documents, not regulatory documents. This means that no agency or entity is required by the ESA to implement the recovery strategy or specific actions recommended in a recovery plan. However, the ESA clearly envisions recovery plans as the central organizing tool for guiding each species recovery process. Recovery plans require the cooperation of multiple state and federal agencies, and many plans depend on the assistance of private landowners to meet habitat restoration goals. Section 4 of the ESA allows for public and private entities to develop and implement recovery plans, including the appointing of recovery teams. Many, but not all, recovery plans are written by recovery teams, and in some cases, Implementation of plans is guided by recovery teams. Fishery management plans are developed by the Regional Fishery Management Councils and implemented by the National Marine Fisheries Service. Regional Fishery Management Councils are charged with developing and recommending fishery management plans, both to restore depleted stocks and manage healthy stocks. The National Marine Fisheries Service aids the Secretary of Commerce who evaluates, approves, and implements the Council's plans. A fishery management plan must specify the criteria which determine when a stock is overfished and the measures needed to rebuild it. Regional councils regulate annual catch limits, individual catch limits, community development quotas, and others. 
Increasingly, agencies are taking a more holistic view of multiple species or entire systems with an ecosystem management approach. Managers have long recognized that the manipulation of any one species inevitably has impacts on multiple other species in an ecosystem. Furthermore, certain management actions have the potential to benefit multiple target species, which is a more efficient use of limited resources. This often involves thinking about restoring or mimicking the ecological processes that have historically kept ecosystems healthy and functioning, things like fire, flooding, grazing, and predation. One common example is the many species that can be negatively impacted when fire is suppressed from an ecosystem that was historically maintained by periodic fires. Putting fire back into the system by using prescribed burns, for example, could benefit multiple species and be far more cost effective. In the southeast U.S., the endangered red cockaded woodpecker requires fire-maintained pine grassland habitats that had become very rare due to timber harvest and fire exclusion. When managers began to use mid-story vegetation removal and prescribed fire, the woodpeckers began to make a comeback. When scientists studied the ecological impacts of this management regime, they found a suite of uncommon plant and animal species that favored these open habitat types. Military installations have a substantial role in recovery and continuing conservation of RCWs. There are six installations that contain all or part of six primary core RCW populations of the 13 required for delisting. Eglin Air Force Base, Fort Benning, Georgia, Fort Bragg, Fort Polk, Louisiana, Fort Stewart, Georgia, and Marine Corps Base Camp Lejeune in North Carolina. RCW populations increased by up to 50% from 1994 to 2002 at each of these installations. Ecosystem management was formally adopted two decades ago by many federal land management agencies, including the Forest Service and the Bureau of Land Management. This approach calls for management based on stakeholder collaboration, interagency cooperation, integration of scientific, social, and economic information, preservation of ecological processes, and adaptive management. And its cooperative policy for the ecosystem approach to the Endangered Species Act, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and the National Marine Fisheries Service states, quote, success of ecosystem management will depend on the cooperation of partners, federal, state, and private, setting new internal standards for teamwork and communication between regions and other agencies will be emphasized to support an ecosystem approach to species conservation. Species will be conserved best not by a species-by-species -species approach, but by an ecosystem conservation strategy that transcends individual species. The future for endangered and threatened species will be determined by how well the agencies integrate ecosystem conservation with the growing need for resource use." Unquote. 